So the, the test kind of becomes the reference. And then you should say, okay, then uh, this initial simulation doesn't seem to match perfectly. What happened during the test that you know I can try and reproduce in my simulation? And most likely in structural testing, what we see number one is boundary conditions, measured deformation. And, and so you can learn about what's happening during the test. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because it's a lot more, you know, it's kind of continuous point tracking, 400 hours, right? Just a, a PhD working in Excel for 400 hours to make sure that, you know, strain gauges were matching and, and so on. That's what the difference between someone who's experimented in this field and someone who's just, you know, younger and starting the, the job is the capacity to put yourself into a sub, well, or your simulation model into a certain level of doubt, uh, not, you know, just assess because as you said, it's not because you have run the simulation and because it has converged. You can be pretty happy about that, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's right yet. All right, Florent, welcome to the Internet Man podcast. Thank you. Hi. So today we'll, we'll talk about building simulation credibility through something called data fusion. That's an interesting term. We I don't know what it's all about, but maybe before we get started, can you quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, what is your background? What are you actually doing? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm from Mathieu. I'm the CEO of Icosim. Uh, I have a background in, I'd say, me mechanical engineering to be to be large, um, science, material sciences, uh, and uh, we created Icosim seven years ago now um, from our research back in the lab. Uh, we're working on well different techniques. Uh, I'll maybe explain later, but uh, uh, I'm yeah. Now I'm in charge of uh, everything commercial and, and engineering at, uh, at Ecosim. Amazing. We'll talk about Ecosim in a bit. I think I want to get started in the podcast with maybe the terms verification and validation. So maybe uh -huh. could you differentiate those terms and what does it mean for engineers to do verify, verifying a model and also validating a model in the first place? Sure. Yeah. So there's different terms going on, I would say, in this domain. You can hear, sometimes you hear VNV. Now, the most recent um, terms, I think, are VVUQ. So they, they stand for verification and validation, and UQ is uncertainty quantification. Mm -hmm. So these topics are all about making sure a model, uh, you know, is kind of predictive to a certain reality. And you have different, different parts of it. So usually you go in this way, start with verification. Uh, verification means that you will you know, make sure that the problem is solved correctly uh, when referring to the equations of the problems or to how you put the problems into a math problem, I would say. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, you have the right uh, way of solving, if you talk about finite element, for instance, uh, in solid mechanics, do you solve the problem correctly means do you solve the, the elements correctly? Are the equations okay? And do they represent a certain, you know, reality? Uh, with respect to the math that you want to put in uh, your, your uh, global problem. So this is yeah. verification. And validation on, on the opposite is, well, you have a problem running, but does it represent correctly a certain reality? Uh, meaning, can you compare it, can you confront it to something else and make sure that it looks like the, the, the element that you're you confronting it to? For instance, a lot of the validation is done well, you have basically two cases. You can validate mostly um, with test results. If you have a physical test, uh, a, a prototype that you're testing, you can make sure that the simulation model kind of has the same uh, results. Uh, well, it's it's complicated matter to know um, which you know which locations you should compare to. Should you compare in the case of solid mechanics strain or forces, etc. So. Basically, validating a model against a test is making sure that um, you know it gives the same results, uh, give or take. And you can also, of course, validate the results of a finite element simulation with you know an analytical problem. Uh, you can do that, obviously. The main thing is you have your uh, problem that's um, you know yours, and then you're going to validate it with something else. Uh, uh, on, on the side, and then you have uncertainty quantification. It kind of speaks for itself is the fact that you are able to evaluate what kind of errors and certainties lie within your problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it can comes from various sources, obviously. 
Yeah. Why, I mean, maybe it's a trivial question. Why is engineering validation testing so important? Well, I, I would say that there's a, there's a few examples of that. And I can maybe tell this, that there's been a few benchmarks for simulation tools um, um, all around um, in the last maybe, I don't know, 50 years. Uh, but there's been recent benchmarks, even for pretty simple problems, I would say. Um, verification can be handled uh, internally, but then really predicting something with simulation uh, blindly is it's kind of difficult and there, there's been as i said a few benchmarks that uh, you know were people were asking you know we have this problem just put it into um, an fe problem for instance a crack propagation problem uh, which is something that's kind of difficult uh, and let's try and predict this phenomenon and the, the answers coming from all around the world were pretty different actually uh, the, the results were pretty different and this is, is kind of puts the finger on the fact that a simulation alone without the proper validation and certain quantification uh, is is just a model right it's it's mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's the, the actual uh, problem is solved it means that you have a representation of this problem but to actually kind of put your you know, your hand in in the in in on the bill, and you know, make sure that you're going to uh, actually develop a system based on this simulation, kind of decision uh, decision making based on simulation. This is kind of another level, right? It's not just an indicator; it's something that you have to uh, make entirely sure that you're within, I don't know, five or 10% of what's actually going to happen. Because if it doesn't, there's going to be an accident or a problem. Uh, and, you know, usually uh, when you just want to have kind of a ballpark, you can make a simulation. But if you want to be really precise and make sure that your system is going to behave exactly like you uh, think it is, you should make a physical test or some kind of validation because um, you know, there's always a risk, even for experts, there's always a risk. Mm -hmm. Would you say, um, because you work with a lot of industry partners at the, at the current stage, is the distribution kind of like 80, 20, 70, 30 in terms of test to simulation? Or what could you say here? I, I'd say it depends on the industry uh, mm -hmm. and also on the phase, because during development, some people are doing a lot of testing early on. Now, I would say with the advances of simulation, more and more people are trying to do the tests at, at, as late as possible in the development process. But I don't think it's a good idea either. So um, strategies differ, I would say. But um, for some of our customers, they have basically, on, on, if you talk about budget, they have kind of either 50-50 or sometimes on some projects they have more simulation on even only simulation if they have validated the models uh, but overall i would say 50 50 is probably a good uh yeah a good good ballpark yeah do you also advise people what strategy to go for like for example how to allocate resources to testing or simulation because at the end of the day i think flora you mm. help engineers actually test less right so you're saving a lot of money mm. in terms of testing yeah, so that's basically everyone's uh, uh, goal and target is to test less because obviously test is very expensive. Mm. But you could say also that simulation can be really expensive. It can be expensive because you have you allocate a lot of resources to it. Also because if you if you take a look at the risks of simulation, you can say that you, well probably that's an argument that can be defended that if you spend a lot on simulation and nothing in testing it's going to cost you a lot to perform simulations because it takes you take a huge risk and if you have an accident it's yeah. going to be really costly so mm -hmm. yeah so in in the end i would say that what we sell is confidence in simulation models because i would say that to go from a situation where you have basically only testing which is what nobody's doing right now because it's kind of advanced, but I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, people weren't using simulation that much. People started from only, you know, prototype building and then just testing uh, and analytical solutions, obviously. And then more and more simulation developed. And now people are starting to say, oh, you know, what, what if we developed an airplane and just the 
individual bits are tested, but the whole thing is not tested anymore because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the things that uh, you know people have in mind is to remove as much testing as possible because it it doesn't it's not on, only cost it's also you know development time because obviously testing is extremely long um, to to perform to prepare then to perform then to post process and the simulation model is more convenient on that side too. Um, yeah. So yeah, in the end, that's what people want to do. But our argument is, let's go this way because it's probably better for everyone. But let's go this way while making sure that simulation models are really, you know, well thought and thoroughly prepared to make sure that you know you're not creating risks in the end. Yeah, how do you convince someone to actually do? to do less testing because I think there's a big safety concern. For example, if you talk, we're talking yeah. about automotive aerospace industry, so yes. what methods can you actually use to, mm. to tell people, well, this method that we use is actually safe? Mm. Yeah, the, the, this, this is the big question for simulation users, right? Is can I base my decision only or mostly on my simulation model? And can I, you know, this is basically the, the question for our customers. So what we say is, you should have a method to uh, to measure, to estimate uh, the kind of the level of credibility that a model has. Uh, so you should not only develop the model itself, you know, take this the CAD uh, model, put it into a mesh, converge the mesh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a procedure to it, and that ends with, as I said earlier, validation and certain configuration. And so if you put this process into place and you adopt one of the, you know, there's frameworks to do that. So you can, you can adopt a framework to make sure that you don't miss a step basically. Uh, and in the end you have kind of um, measurement on how, uh, you know, how uncertain the simulation is. So you have kind of a quality measurement for your simulation. And this implies a lot of, you know, th there's a lot of different elements to do obviously, but Basically, our job is to, you know, help pe people, uh, our customers get better at some of these elements so that in the end they can, you know, um, take a, a step and remove some of the testing. But before doing that, obviously, this is the end goal. And every, well, our customers are really, uh, I would say, clever about that. They're, they're not just saying, well, remove some tests. And I want to reassure everyone's getting into a plane. Nobody's you know, playing with that. Obviously, everyone's really serious about that. But they sometimes lack the capacity to say, OK, we will get better at this or this, which will make us you know, able to actually remove some of the testing. And this is really a step-by-step -step thing. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, how do you bridge the gap then between testing and simulation? So that's that's one of the key things, as you said earlier, is uh, what's called data fusion. Um, and this is something that we saw earlier in our, in our company life. Uh, we were maybe I can explain a little bit about what we do if you want, uh, maybe to mm -hmm, sure. uh, uh, you know answer that because we we started with developing uh, digital image correlation um, you know software products. So for those of you who don't know, digital image correlation is called DAC. I'll say DAC for short. Uh, this is an image processing technique that allows to measure deformation from an image, basically. So you have an image of a picture, a series of pictures of uh, a solid that's deforming. You can, from this image, uh, you can um, measure deformation. And, and so you can learn about what's happening during the test. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's a lot more, you know, it's kind of continuous point tracking. I would say on the surface um, of, your, of your, your part. So you don't just have one sensor that's measuring strain, like a strain gauge, but you have an, a whole thing, um, whole surface that you can measure from. Uh, and this is interesting because it, it kind of participate to that thing that I was saying, you know, you should know more about what's happening on your prototype because it's going to, you know, reassure you and give you more trust than the simulation model is, is right. For instance, if you have strain localization around the hole or something like that, you're able to measure it. And so you evaluate how far you were. And if you were close enough, this is probably a good thing for you, right? Uh, and so we were developing this and we actually found that people were having trouble already 
making sure that you know for complex tests there's a lot of sensors to compare everything from the test data set to the simulation data set it mm -hmm. can be a huge problem there's one of our customers they recently they told us that you know there's there was this simulation engineer who had you know like a thousand hours for this particular project and they spend like 40 percent of that time just managing data within excel to make sure to, to, to perform validation that's what i said right to compare the simulation data to the data that comes out of the test bench 400 hours right just a, a phd working in excel for 400 hours to make sure that you know strain gauges were matching and, and so on so mm -hmm. we, we were trying to bring it we're kind of naive about that i would say about image processing because we're thinking you know that's the, the perfect strategy to bridge the gap and then in the end people didn't even have time for this because they were struggling with their own thing uh, and uh, that's what led us to developing a more of a data fusion platform because in our opinion um uh, th there's a few things but th the first thing that I, I said is it takes a lot of time to do that because it's insanely complex testing right sometimes you have on the you you probably know that video of the the airbus wing that's being bent right mm -hmm. and the, you, you see that uh, fatigue testing it's a thousand sensors it's it's not going to do that you're not going to do that next time, right you, you need specific solution to process these and compare that to a simulation model and so it's a huge amount of times that sometimes spent uh, on this particular complex test and also Obviously, if you do that within Excel, you, me, would make a mistake at some point. So it's human errors as well. Not having a specific mm -hmm. solution and developing your own thing. It's like I said, Joseph, you should develop your own FE solver to solve that crazy, crazily complex problem. You're probably going to make a mistake at some point, and it's going to take mm -hmm. you a lot of time. So our thinking was, for these particular problems, we, you know, they need a dedicated solution to do that. And so Data Fusion is the name of kind of the hat name of that which is you know you should have a platform that blends in the data from the test and from the simulation side uh, in order for them to compare what's happening and to make sure that the simulation is predictive and if it's not to be able to to you know uh, correct it and that's kind of the beginning of what people call digital twins because it's kind of a platform which you know you know you take uh, data from the physical world, the data from the uh, uh, simulation world, I'd say, mm -hmm. and then you try just to compare, which is kind of the base of the digital twin, and then you would, you know, update the simulation, possibly also update the, what's happening in the test, and this what would make it the real digital twin, as is uh, as academic sense, I would say. Yeah, I like the explanation, Flora. Uh, question I would have maybe going a step backwards is you have this point tracking system with the camera. How yeah. do you differentiate? Uh, it reminds me a bit of solid mechanics class back from uni where you have the uh -huh. starting configuration and the end configuration. How do you differentiate between an elongation of a point, like yeah. moving from point A to point B, and a rotation? Yes. Is it just algorithms at the end of the day? Well, if you have, well, let, let me tell you this. I should make a drawing of this, but okay, you can imagine. You have a white square, like a sheet of mm. paper, and you draw yeah. kind of a circle on it, right? Mm. A black circle on it. So if I just rotate the sheet, you probably won't see any movement. But now if you mm. have a lot of these points around, you will notice that I rotated the sheet because there's, there's a whole you know, global movement that's happening. And the, the algorithm, what it does is, is basically following those gray levels from the camera. And it says, okay, mm -hmm. it, it actually doesn't measure the formation. It measured displacements for each of these points. And then if you have displacement for the whole field, obviously you can, you know, calculate the, the, the strains and the, it, yeah. it kind of works like that. And so obviously this, this is one part of the answer. The other part is usually on these you know, complex tests, it's like 3D geometries. You cannot be just uh, using one camera. You're going to be using more. So you have different points of view on that problem. And this helps you not only uh, measure a 2D problem, but uh, a whole 3D surface. Uh, this mm -hmm. is uh, how it's working. That makes sense. When we go back to the data fusion thing, you have your own type of software. So does it actually mean that you help the engineer tweak the simulation parameters to make sure that the simulation fits the testing? And how do you actually do that? Like, Are there different types mm -hmm. of scenarios where you use data fusion? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that inside of the software? Yeah, this is kind of... The 
possible end of the story. I would say for most cases, already validation itself, meaning comparison of data is a huge problem. Mm. So that's what we spend, I would say, 60 to 70% of our time on. And then obviously at the end of this comparison, you, you have some sort of a model form error. Um, you have sometimes, uh, you know, a perfect agreement between simulation and testing, in which case everyone's happy. But if, it, if you don't have that, you have to understand what, what happened, right? And, you know, you, you can, it's, this is kind of a complex moment sometimes, because if you have a disagreement between simulation and the test result, uh, probably people from the simulation side are going to say, you know, probably the test people didn't, you know, apply the boundary conditions that I asked for. Uh, they apply something a little bit different, or maybe the sensors were, were, weren't positioned exactly the right way. And on the opposite side, you have test people saying, well, you know, simulation engineers, they are, live in the perfect world. They, they're idealistic. The boundary condition was supposed to be a perfect, uh, you know, no movement surface, but it doesn't exist in real life. And so you have that moment where uh, it's kind of a human thing more than, uh, you know, engineering. It's, it's really about, you know, we kind of act as a neutral force when we're uh, in a service business and we say, you know, there's all these kinds of uncertainties, let's list them. Let's make sure that we didn't forget anything. And then let's try to evaluate for each of these sources, which one are the most likely to provoke what's, what's happened in, in, the, in the sense of uh, the model error. And I would say there's kind of a, thing where initially the model is kind of the reference because that's the only thing that exists. Most people start with the model now, but then when the mm -hmm. test is done, it becomes kind of a new reference. You shouldn't, you know, should always remember that it's also a, some, some kind of a model of the actual system, right? It's not the actual system. It's some part of a system within a lab. It's not, you know, flying anything, but it's, it's kind of a better model because it's probably closer to what's going to happen because it has the right geometry at least close to. So the, the test kind of becomes the reference. And then you should say, okay, then uh, this initial simulation doesn't seem to match perfectly. What happened during the test that, you know, I can try and reproduce in my simulation. And most likely in structural testing, what we see number one is boundary conditions, because it's extremely different, difficult to apply an ideal boundary condition, you know, X, displacement and zero on Y and Z, never saw mm -hmm. that. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But everyone's expecting the test to confirm that the simulation model was right about that. And it, it just doesn't. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's fine. But it's ha it can have a huge impact if you're trying to, if you're sticking to your ideal boundary condition, you know, it can, you can make it kind of a big error on the actual, you know, localized train or, you know, Young's modules, whatever. So basically our job is to help people kind of converge. Uh, and one of these, the ways to do that, as you said, is to tweak the parameters for the models. One simple example is you have, um, you know, material testing, a very simple test. Um, you're pretty sure about your boundary conditions, but maybe you're not so sure about the material model that you used within your simulation model. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, then you can, you know, huh, what, what can I do? Well, if you do it manually, you would change the Young's modules or change the Poisson ratio or change this or this parameter to make it fit. Well, we have algorithms that can kind of do that for you, right? It's based on sensitivity studies, which is something that simulation engineers know, uh, basically tweaking the parameters, looking if the error is going up or down, and then from that learning how to, so it's not machine learning, but Gordon is kind of learning how to you know, uh, just go down the, the gradients and make sure that you, you end up in the, at the point where the error is lower, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in terms of assessing the maturity of the model, uh, Floro, is mm -hmm. there any specific framework that you're using or any guidelines in general? Yeah, th there are a few frameworks. I would I should say that not to, you know, we have our, our preferred uh, frameworks, obviously, but I would say that it's, it's not really common yet uh, to, to use a framework, just to use a framework. And for people yeah. using a framework, they use most of the, the ones I've seen are um, inspired from technological, uh, technological readiness levels, mm -hmm. uh, which 
kind of apply to simulation models, but kind of not as well. Uh, and so most people are trying to readapt something that they um, that they already know. I would say in that in that um, area. And the one we like, well, we're using one. There's a few that are um, good, obviously, but the one we like is called uh, PCMM. Uh, so it's predictive capability maturity model. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a six categories framework that tell you, you know, you should be interested in, you know, geometry and boundary conditions, uh, item one, and then, uh, you know, verification and then validation and then uncertainty quantification, et cetera, et cetera. You have all these items, but the point is that maybe my advice would be to use a framework that's dedicated to simulation modeling. And that's not just something that's adapted for, uh, any technology because simulation has, you know, specific categories that should be addressed. And maybe if you adapt something, you know, they are going to fit within that new framework, but it's not really natural. And people have worked on this topic. So I was, I would, you know, encourage people to get interested in these frameworks, especially the, there's one called CAS also, uh, credibility. Ah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure anyway. So I'm not going to say something, uh, uh, make a mistake, just uh, go look it up. But it's it's developed by NASA as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I, anyway, there's there's a lot of good frameworks. But I I, I want to encourage people to you know get interested in that because we use that one because it's convenient for us. The, the only thing is um, it, you should use a framework that's really adapted to simulation. Is is my point? Are there any downsides of using PCMM? Yeah, well, long term, we, we hope, sure hope not, because you would say, you would hope that if you are um, um, more interested in quality, that probably is going to be rewarded at the end. Uh, but the thing with every quality effort is that it costs money, obviously. And just within, so the, the PCMM framework itself, it just, it's published, it exists, it's not going to cost you anything. Uh, the, the effort is going to cost you. And so uh, obviously you would say that you have to find a way to, um, you know, that for management to be um, a, a part of the solution and not a part of the problem, I would say, because that's, there's some solutions where, you know, we have, we have that simulation model, it works. And you've, as an engineer, you might have sold that to your management saying, you know, it solved perfectly the problem. And then you come back and say, oh, maybe we should improve quality because it's not that great. And this is something that's a little bit difficult sometimes because it, you're going to ask for more resources and more time on this project to really be thorough. And it's probably good for the simulation, but it, how good should you end up to be is maybe the question. And management has to deal with the budget at some point. So this is what's hard. Uh, I mean, in general, with every quality effort, I would say. But yeah. my belief is that if we want simulation to reach a maturity level in general, I mean, not just, you know, your particular simulation, but a, a simulation in, in general, if we wanted to reach a level of maturity where it can be admitted that it, it's really part of the solution, um, it has to be serious, right? Basically. So you have to be serious about how you evaluate your simulation capacity to, to answer the problem. And this costs money, right? Well, maybe it will take some time for everyone to accept that. Uh, there's some industries where, you know, a ballpark simulation is good enough. But for, as you said, for airspace, aerospace, automotive industries, you cannot, you know, play with safety and security. So you have to make sure that if you base your decisions on simulation, there's going to be a little bit more effort to do if you really want to be sure that you can trust it. And well, trust, confidence, it's credibility. It's kind of the same thing, right? So, plays yeah. in the same domain yeah i think it goes back to also when i first started using abacus do you would you advise students to use a specific framework whether that's pcmm or cas as you mentioned from nasa because i think usually in uni at least for me it was like okay there's a step-by-step -step instruction you click this in abacus mm. then you click this yes. you get some yes. colorful images and you think the simulation is right but all these boundary <laughs> conditions are like an idealization of the real world so yes. what would you advise maybe to the listeners who get started in simulation or maybe students yes. Um, to learn PCMM or CAS or maybe a different mm. framework? I would say not necessarily, they are not going to, well, young engineers, they can have an opinion on that, but they are not going to the one who implement it right away because it's experts who decide that kind of things, right? Mm. But 
uh, I can say that if, when we meet with simulation engineers and discuss, you know, model error, as I said before, you can have, you know, sometimes discrepancies between simulation and testing. You can see right away if an engineer has experience in validation or not. And it's not to, you know, um, point a finger or anything, but young engineers obviously don't have that much experience. And so sometimes they're pretty sure that their simulation model is right, uh, which is true to some extent, but also wrong to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you can see right away when someone says, you know, this is just a preliminary model. It's, it's supposed to kind of predict be in the ballpark, but it's not supposed to be extremely uh, adequate yet. And we have this and this and this sources of uncertainty. And I would encourage to read these documents just to be aware that, you know, there's all of these sources of uncertainty and that actual physical prototypes are not going to be perfect or perfectly put into place. There's going to be, you know, spaces between parts during the test is going to move a little bit differently. And if your experience, the more experience you get, the, the, the most you will understand that there's going to be these things no matter what. And so you, you, you have to learn to accept that and to understand them and not just close your eyes on them and learn how to accept them. And then, okay, let's deal with them. Uh, it, it's more work, obviously, but I think that's what, that's what the difference between someone who's experimented in this field and someone who's just, you know, younger and starting the, the job is the capacity to put yourself into a sub, well, or your simulation model into a certain level of doubt. Uh, not, you know, just assess because, as you said, it's not because you have run the simulation and because it has converged. You can be pretty happy about that, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's right yet. Right? So you have a little, little bit more steps to, to, to go through. And I mean, it's, it's a happy process. I mean, it's really interesting field, right? Being able to go into a test lab and see how things are really done. This also helps a lot. And experience comes from that as well, because your next time that you're going to put a simulation in, in Abacus or, or another software, you're going to think about that and say, okay, what could go wrong? And what, what should I, you know, perform a sensitivity study to? Uh, this, these are good practices that you gain with experience and that, as you said, are not always taught in uni. Definitely. I think it was a good summary for all. Speaking about going to the test lab, which is a nice experience, what would you say maybe as a case study was your, your most favorite project, maybe using DIC? Huh. It's not easy because there've, there's been a few. There's, there's mm -hmm. one of the first tests that uh, I've participated into when I was in Ecosim and out of the lab which was a, a project for um, OECD, which is a European organization that uh, you know, is supposed to make sure that you have safety. And I think it was for nuclear plants. And they were making a benchmark. There was this kind of a big concrete structure. It's like two by two by two meters, kind of cube. And they were throwing a huge projectile at it, 100 meters per second. And it was hitting the surface and there was dust everywhere. It was incredible. And we got to measure this with high-speed cameras. So we got, I, I got to go alone in Finland. I'm, I'm from France. I, I went to Finland. Underground lab, uh, you know, foreign bunker. And um, there was this uh, huge room where I, I get to go, you know, at 10 meters high, put the cameras to make sure that they weren't, uh, you know, impacted by anything. Uh, and, and to measure that and to give results on this kind of test. It was, it was pretty intense uh, to start my career with. Uh, at Ecosin, uh, but it was nice. I mean, most of the time I would say the ones we remember are dynamic tests because the explosive is kind of more fun as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's not the most, always the most difficult when you have the right uh, cameras, the right hardware, but it's always the more fun to, to be. And does can this, this kind of pressure just between uh, the moment that you set up the hardware and the moment when you press the button, uh, that is extremely nice. So I would encourage people to visit the uh, Dynamics uh, lab. It's really fun. Yeah. On the other side, would you say that there's some tedious projects that you've worked on? Maybe solving, I don't know, disputes between simulation and test engineers, something like that. Yeah, well, the, this is where you get, I would say, not the stress, but you should, well, we learn to manage these situations, as I said, but uh, there's not 
huge disputes. Usually people are reasonable, but you have to, you know, make sure everyone, everyone wins in the process, right? So you shouldn't mm. point figures. You should, you should never do that. You should just say, okay, let's evaluate everything, be reasonable, be, you know, use science and then we'll figure it out. Uh, and so I don't think there's been, so of course, we, so some people that are a little bit more, you know, uh, attached to their own conception of things. But in general, I say it's, it's always a win. I mean, there's, I, I don't have particularly bad memories actually. Okay. When you maybe look into the future, five, 10, maybe 50 years, mm -hmm. where do you see test and simulation changing? Maybe in terms of distribution. So there will be more mm -hmm. simulation, maybe more tests, maybe less tests. What is mm -hmm. your estimation for the future? Ah, uh, the thing is everyone's trying to, well, if, if you ask simulation, uh, software, uh, producers, they will say that everything is going to be done with simulation, which, yeah. you know, is going to grow. That's for sure. And I'm, I'm sure of that, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to help that process, but I, I still don't believe in the world without any tests. It's clearly not because yeah. there's always going to be new materials, new assemblies, new geometries that you need to make up your mind about. So probably less testing, but better testing, I would say, because that's one of the things we do with cameras. We, you know, bring more hardware, try to, you know, get more data out of it, make sure that we know everything that's, that we should know about what happened during the test. But then at the same time, if you do that, you are going to be more confident and you can remove maybe half of the testing or something like that, depending on the, the industry. So. Maybe something additional would be that the way we're working on um, the, the direction we're working uh, uh, in is more integration between test and you know, test hardware and simulation tools. Yeah. I don't know exactly how we're building some of the solutions ourselves, but uh, there, there, there's more obviously. Uh, but in the end, I would say that probably um, the ones who will succeed in integrating both worlds. Uh, will probably be um, stronger because they have this, you know, continuous kind of how CAD and CAE integrated. At some point, it, originally it was different, you know, solutions, and then more and more it's integrated into one, you know, big package that you can have CAD yeah. and CAE at the same time. I would say that it would be a good thing that uh, test results come into that chain and you have a, a full digital digital thread with the test results in, in, in the inside. It's definitely the direction that uh, big players are taking. And I'm, I'm talking about clients, you know, for example, I know that at, at, at Airbus, this, there's programs to do that. It's also the case at other manufacturers. Um, I think everyone would, would benefit from that. I think it's, yeah, that's a good point. One of the things also, when I looked at your YouTube channel floor was I've seen that you can also use Blender to kind of set up your experiment or like your cameras. Mm. Yeah. What I also see, like it happens more, more frequently that engineers use Blender as a tool to maybe prepare testing, maybe do some yes. machine learning stuff instead of Blender. How do wow. you personally use it to prepare maybe test mm. testing in general? The, the reason we've started using that is, well, I started as a research project, but um, we've started using that more when we encounter, encounter test situations where we should put a lot of different cameras on, around the test. Like the mm -hmm. most we've done is probably eight, eight to 10 cameras on the same test. And when you do that, you, well, the test lab people, they don't expect you to spend a week within the test lab, just setting up the cameras, making sure the angles are right and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So they don't have that time. So if you want to install more, more cameras, you need a solution to make sure that they are at the right place. That if you have to build a scaffold that is built right directly and that you don't, you know, play with that. And so Blender is a way for us to simulate how the cameras interact within this environment uh, and to try different positions, look at what's happening, what the camera is seeing uh, uh, on, on the test, virtual test scene, and um, you know, using that information to uh, adjust the, the camera locations, making sure that the measurement is going to go well. So it's basically a time-saving thing. Uh, and for us to, to trust that uh, the measurement is going to go well. So we use that. The reason why we use Blender is because obviously it's an animation software, but it has a lot of tools that revolve around the use of cameras. Because mm -hmm. obviously 
uh, you know, they need that. So there's not everything we need, but a lot of uh, ingredients that we need to simulate what's go actually going to happen during the test. Uh, and for instance, is something going to, you know, if it's a dynamic test, are things going to, you know, pass in front of the camera or is it position right, etc. You can have a lot of questions. Um, for instance, uh, the, we have customers using mirrors uh, because they cannot synchronize. They have ultra high speed cameras that are really hard to synchronize and they're using a mirror to have kind of two points of view within the same image. Uh, mm -hmm. When you do that in Blender, you can model a, a mirror and you can position it right so that you, you're pretty sure that when the structure deforms, it, you know, you will catch that movement or that specific strain uh, point that you're looking for. So it's basically kind of a preparation thing. And yeah, I've seen it using more and more, and, and um, especially when people use this ca um, cameras, it high, can be high-speed cameras to make sure they catch some sort of phenomenon or the kind of things. If you have a model, you can put it into Blender, with, uh, kind of develop a, a tool for that. You you know, take an ABAC solution, you put it into Blender and you will see the form, uh, the way that it's supposed to be deforming if, if the simulation is right. Uh, and it helps you predict uh, how you should do things. And it's it's really, and also it's a fun tool uh, because it's, uh, there's a huge community about this, uh, obviously more on the animation side, but people are working like crazy to improve it. And so we really benefit from that as well. Yeah, definitely powerful. I think it would also be incredibly beneficial to maybe showcase or demo the software at some point on my channel. I think people would mm. be super interesting in that. Maybe we could have a live session on YouTube where you could demonstrate what the software can actually do and how you use it. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, maybe maybe any closing remarks, any motivating words, how I always like to say to the uh, engineering community out there who want to get started with verification, uh, validation, testing. <laughs> yeah, I'd, as I'd say the main problem maybe that we've seen is the fact that people want to stay comfortable in their silo, right? The industry is really yeah, yeah. siloed. You have the simulation team, you have the CAD team, you have the test team, even, even on the provider's uh, side, right? You have uh, Abacus and, you know, the source system is not that interested, I believe, in hardware systems or measurement uh, string gauges and so on. So it's really siloed and it's really hard for people to understand each other if they don't you know, share information. And so I would encourage people to, as, as I said before, go into the test lab if you're a simulation engineer, or if you're a test engineer, go ask for simulation users what they expect, what they, you know, what they think, what they uh, want to do in the future. Really talk more with each other. And I think especially for large companies, it's harder because it's even more siloed than medium-sized companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so in general, I, this is maybe the, and, and maybe the, the strongest form of this would be, uh, I really enjoy working with simulation engineers who actually were test engineers before, or the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who has a career and goes from one point to another, these person are really open-minded and really fun to work with because you're not going to fight again against an argument of uh, uh, is your boundary condition right or something like that. You're not going to do that because you know that uh, you know, these people understand that. So if you have if you have a career, if you think you, you want to have a career in mechanical engineering, really be open-minded about you know not only going in simulations, which I think is the way for a lot of young engineers, but also consider like just doing an internship uh, with you know some some testing in it. Uh, I think would be extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. I think it's good good closing remarks and uh, two learnings from my end is don't have a big ego. And then also <laughs> all models yeah. are wrong, but some are useful as uh, George Box uh, used exactly. to say. Exactly. Cool. And um, I'll put any resources for Ecosim down in the description for anyone interested in checking them out. You have a demo uh, that you can also check out, a white paper and a lot of interesting videos. So I'll put every relevant link down in the description. And with that, Florent, thank you so much for being on the Engineer Mind podcast and sure. hopefully thank see you, you in the second episode. Sure. Uh, with pleasure.